Good evening, my name is Joseph Sippitz. I'm here for the St. Joseph County Public Library. It's time for another Saturday Night Story. Tonight we'll be reading from the book called An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge by Ambrose Bierce. Uh, we won't actually be reading that story. We'll be reading a different one, um, even though that is his most famous story. Instead, we'll be reading one that's called The Damned Thing. One does not always eat what is on the table. By the light of the tallow candle, which had been placed on one end of a rough table, a man was reading something written in a book. It was an old account book, greatly worn, and the writing was not apparently very legible, for the man sometimes held the page close to the flame of the candle to get a stronger light on it. The shadow of the book would then throw into obscurity half of the room, darkening a number of faces and figures, for besides the reader, eight other men were present. Seven of them sat against the rough log walls, silent, motionless, and the room being small, not very far from the table. By extending an arm, any one of them could have touched the eighth man who lay upon the table, face upward, partly covered by a sheet, his arms at his side. He was dead. The man with the book was not reading aloud, and no one spoke. All seemed to be waiting for something to occur. The dead man only was without expectation. From the bland darkness outside came in through the aperture that served for a window all the ever unfamiliar noises of the night in the wilderness, the long nameless note of the, dis the distant coyote, the uh, stilly pulsing thrill of tireless insects in the trees, strange cries of, of night birds so different from those birds of the day, the drone of great blundering beetles and all the mysterious chorus of small sounds that have always um, have uh, been but half heard when they are suddenly ceased, as if conscious of an indiscretion. But nothing of all this was noted in the company. No members uh, were over uh, much addicted to the idle interest of matters of no practical importance. That was obvious to in every line of their rugged faces, obvious even in the dim light of a single candle. They were evidently men of the vicinity, farmers and woodsmen. The person reading the trifle account, one would have said of him that he was of the world, worldly. Albeit there was that in his attire that attested a certain fellowship with the organization of his environment. His coat would hardly have passed muster in San Francisco. His footgear was not of urban origin, and the hat that lay by him on the floor, he was the only one uncovered, was such that if one had considered it as an article of mere personal adornment, he would have, it would, would have missed its meaning. In countenance, the men uh, the man was rather prepossessing, with a with just a hint of sternness, though he may have assumed or uh, cultivated that as appropriate to one in authority, for he was the coroner. It was by virtue of his office that he had possession of the book in which he was reading. It had been found among the dead man's effects in the cabin where the inquest was now taking place. When the coroner had finished reading, he put the book into his breast pocket. At that moment, the door was pushed open and a young man entered. He clearly was not of mountain birth and breeding. He was clad as those who dwell in cities. His clothing, dirty, however, as from travel. He had, in fact, been riding hard to attend this inquest. The coroner nodded. No one else greeted him. We have waited for you said the coroner. It is necessary to have done with this business tonight. The young man smiled. I am sorry to have kept you, he said. I went away not to evade your summons, but to post to my newspaper an account of what I suppose I am called back to relate. The coroner smiled. The account that you posted to your newspaper, he said, uh, off, um, differs uh, probably, from that which you will give here tonight under oath. That, replied the other rather hotly, with 
a visible um, flush is as you please. I used manifold paper and have a copy of what I wrote. It is not written as news, for it is incredible, but as fiction. It may go as part of my testimony under oath. But you say it's incredible. That is nothing to you, sir, if I also swear that it is true. The coroner was silent for a time, his eyes upon the floor. The men about the sides of the cabin talked in whispers, but seldom withdrew their gaze from the face of the corpse. Presently, the coroner lifted his eyes and said, We will resume the inquest. The men removed their hats. The witness was sworn. What is your name? The coroner asked. William Harker. Age? 27. You knew the deceased, Hugh Morgan? Yes. <clears throat> You were with him when he died? Near him. How did it happen? Your presence, I mean. I was visiting him at his place to shoot and fish. A part of my purpose, however, was to study him in his odd, solitary way of life. He seemed a good model for a character in fiction. I sometimes write verses. I sometimes read them. Thank you. Stories in general, not yours. Some of the jurors laughed. Again, the somber background uh, humor shows highlights. Soldiers in intervals of battle laugh easily, and the just in the death chamber conquers by surprise. Relate the circumstances of this man's death, said the coroner. You may use any notes or memoranda that you please. The witness understood. Pulling the manuscript from his breast pocket, he held it near the candle turning the leaves until he found the passage that he wanted, and he began to read. What may happen in the field of wild oats? The sun had hardly risen when we left the house. We were looking for quail, each with a shotgun, but we had only one dog. Morgan said that our best ground was beyond the certain ridge that he had pointed out, and we crossed it by the trail through the chaparral. On the other side was comparatively level ground, thickly covered with wild oats. As we emerged from the chaparral, Morgan was but a few yards in advance. Suddenly we heard, at a little distance to our right and partly in front, a noise of some animal thrashing about in the, bu in the bushes, which we could see were violently agitated. We've We've startled the deer, I said. I wish we had brought a rifle. Morgan, who had stopped and was intensely watching the agitated chaparral, said nothing, but he had cocked both barrels of his gun and was holding it in readiness to aim. I thought him a trifle excited, which surprised me, for he had a reputation of exceptional coolness, even in uh, moments of sudden and imminent peril. Oh, come, I said. You're not going to fill up a deer with quail shot, are you? Still, he did not reply, but catching sight of his face as he turned it slightly toward me, I was struck by the intensity of his look. Then I understood that we had serious business in hand, and my first conjecture was that we had jumped a grizzly. I advanced to Morgan's side, cocking my piece as I moved. The bushes were now quiet and the sounds had ceased, but Morgan was as attentive to the place as before. What is it? What the devil is it? I said. That damned thing, he replied, without turning his head. His voice was husky and unnatural. He trembled visibly. I was about to speak further when I observed the wild oats near the place of disturbance moving in a most inexplicable way. I could hardly describe it. It seemed as if by a streak of wind uh, which not only bent it, but pressed it down, crushed it as if it were to not rise, and this movement was slowly prolonging itself directly toward us. Nothing that I had seen, ever seen, it affected me so strangely as this unfamiliar and unaccountable phenomenon, and yet I am unable to uh, recall any sense of fear. Um, we rely so on orderly operation of familiar natural laws that any seeming suspension of them is noted as a menace 
to our safety, a warning of unthinkable calamity. So now the apparent careless or causeless movement of the herbage was slow and um, undeviatingly uh, approached of a line of disturbance um, were quietly or distinctly disquieting. My companion appeared actually frightened and I could hardly credit my own senses when I saw him suddenly throw up his gun to his shoulder and fire um, both barrels at the agitated grain. Before the smoke had cleared away, I heard a large savage crowd cry, a, cre a scream that like that of a wild animal. Um, and flinging his gun upon the ground, Morgan sprang away and ran swiftly to, from the spot. At the same instant, I was thrown violently to the ground by the impact of something unseen in the smoke, some soft, heavy disturbance that seemed thrown against me with great force. Before I could get upon my feet and recover my gun, which seemed to have been struck from my hands, I heard Morgan crying out as if in mortal agony, and mingling with his cries were such coarse and savage sounds as one hears from fighting dogs, inexpressibly terrified. I struggled to my feet and looked in the direction of Morgan's retreat, but may heaven have mercy um, and spare me from another sight like that. At a distance of less than 30 yards was my friend, down upon one knee, his head thrown back at a frightening, frightful angle. Hatless, his long hair in disorder, and his whole body was violently moving from side to side, backward and forward. His right arm was lifted and seemed to lack his hand, or at least I could see none. Then the other arm was invisible. At times, as my memory now reports this extraordinary scene, I could discern but a part of his body, and it was as if he had been partly blotted out. I cannot otherwise express it. Then the shifting of his position would bring it all into view again. All this must have occurred within a few seconds, yet in that time Morgan assumed all the, the posture of a determined wrestler, vanquished by superior weight and strength. I saw nothing uh, but him, and not always distinctly. During the entire incident, his shouts and curses were heard as if through an enveloping uproar of such sounds of rage and fury that I have never heard from the throat of a man or brute. For a moment only, I stood irresolute. Then, throwing down my gun, I ran forward to my friend's assistance. I had a vague belief that he was suffering from a fit or some form of convulsion. Before I could reach his side, he was down and quiet. All sounds had ceased, but with the feeling of a such terror that even those awful events had not inspired, I now saw again the mysterious movement of the wild oats prolonging itself from the trampled area about the prostrate man toward the edge of the wood. It was only when it reached the wood that I was able to withdraw my eyes and look at my companion. He was dead. A man, though naked, may be in rags. <clears throat> the coroner rose from his seat and stood beside the dead man. Lifting an edge of the sheet, he pulled it away, exposing the entire body, altogether naked and showing in the candlelight a clay-like yellow. It had, however, broad maculations of bluish black, obviously caused by extravagated blood from contusions. The chest and sides looked as if they had been beaten with a bludgeon. There were dreadful lacerations. The skin was torn in strips and shreds. The coroner moved round to the end of the table and undid a silk handkerchief which had been passed under the chin and knotted around the top of the head. When the hand handkerchief was drawn away, it was exposed it exposed what had been the throat. Some of the jurors who had risen to get a better view repented their curiosity and turned away their faces. Witness Harker went to the open window and leaned out across the sill, the sill faint and sick. 
dropping the handkerchief upon the dead man's neck. The coroner stepped to an angle of the room and from a pile of clothing produced one garment after another, each of which he held up for a moment for inspection. All were torn and stiff with blood. The jurors did not make a closer inspection. They seemed rather uninterested. They had, in truth, seen all this before. The only thing that was new to them was Harker's testimony. Gentlemen, the coroner said, we have no more evidence, I think. Your duty has already been explained to you. If there is nothing you wish to ask, you may now go outside and consider your verdict. The foreman rose, a tall bearded man of 60, coarsely clad. I should like to ask one question, Mr. Coroner, he said. What asylum did your last witness come escape from? Mr. Harker, said the coroner gravely and tranquilly, from what asylum did you last escape? Harker flushed crimson again, but said nothing, and the seven jurors rose and solemnly filed out of the cabin. If you have done insulting me, sir, said Harker, as soon as he and the officer were left alone with the dead man, I suppose I am at liberty to go. Yes. Harker started to leave, but passed, paused with his hand on the door latch. The habit of his profession was strong with him, or stronger than the sense of personal dignity. He turned about and said, the book you have there, I recognize it as Morgan's diary. You seemed greatly interested in it when you read it for a while while I was testifying. May I see it? The public would like the book will cut no figure in this manner, said the official, slipping it into his coat pocket. All the entries in it were made before the writer's death. As Harker passed out of the home, the jury re-entered and stood around the table on which there was the now-covered corpse showing under the sheet with sharp definition. The foreman seated himself near the candle, produced from his breast pocket a pencil and scrap of paper, and wrote rather laboriously the following verdict, which was in various degrees all signed. We, the jury, do find that the remains come to their death at the hands of a mountain lion, but some of us thinks all the same they had fits. Explanation from the tomb. In the diary of the late Hugh Morgan are certain interesting entries having possibly a scientific value as, 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 as suggestions. At the inquest upon his body, the book was not put into evidence. Possibly the coroner thought it was not worth while to confuse the jury. The date of the first of the entries mentioned cannot be ascertained. The upper part of the leaf is torn away, and part of the entry remains as follows. Would turn a half circle, keeping his head turned always toward the center, and again he would stand still, barking furiously. At last he ran into the brush as fast as he could go. I thought that his at first had gone mad, but on returning to the house found that um, no other alteration in his manner than what was obviously due to fear of punishment. Can a dog see with his nose? Do odors impress some cerebral center with images of the thing that em emitted them? September 2nd. Looking at the stars last night as they rose above the crest of the ridge east of the house, I observed them successively disappear from light left to right. Each was eclipsed, but only an instant and only a few at a time. But along the entire length of the ridge, all that were within a degree or two of the crest of the um, blotted out it was as if something had passed along between me and them, but I could not see it, and the stars were not thick enough to define its outline. Don't like it. <clears throat> Don't like it. 
several weeks of entries are missing, three leaves being torn from this book. September 27th. It has been about here again. I find evidences of its presence every day. I watched again all last night in the same cover, gun in hand, double charged with the with buckshot. In the morning, the fresh footprints were there as before. Yet, I would have sworn that I did not sleep. Indeed, I hardly slept at all. It is terrible, insupportable. If these amazing experiences are real, I shall go mad. If they are fanciful, I am mad already. October 3rd. I shall not go. It shall not drive me away. No, this is my house, my land. God hates a coward. October 5th. I can stand it no longer. I have invited Harker to pass a few weeks with me. He is he has a level head, and I can judge from his manner if he thinks me mad. October 7th. I have the solution of the mystery. It came to me last night, suddenly, as by revelation. How simple, how terribly simple. There are sounds that we cannot hear at either end of the scale are notes that stir no chord in the imperfect in, uh, instrument of the human ear. They are too high or too grave. <clears throat> I have observed a flock of blackbirds occupying the entire treetop, the tops of several trees, and all in full song, suddenly in a moment, at suddenly at the absolutely the same time, all spring into the air and fly away. How? They could not all see one another, whole treetops intervened. At no point could a leader have been visible at all. There must have been a signal of warning or command, high and shrill above the din, but by me unheard. I have observed, too, the same simultaneous flight when all were silent among only blackbirds, but other birds, quail, for instance, wild, wild, widely separated by bushes, even on opposite sides of the hill. It is known to seamen that a school of whales basking or sporting on the surface of the ocean miles apart with the convexity of uh, each of earth between will sometimes dive at the same instant, all gone out of sight in a moment. The signal has been sounded too grave for the ear of the sailor at the masthead and his comrades on deck, who nonetheless feel as the vibrations of the ship, as the stones of the cathedral are stirred by the bass of an organ. As with sounds, so with colors. At each end of the solar spectrum, the chemist can detect the presence of what are known as, um, they did it in it, uh, Asinic uh, rays. They represent colors, integral colors in the composition of light, which we are unable to discern. The human eye is an imperfect instrument. In range is but a few octaves of the real chromatic scale. I am not mad. There are colors we cannot see. And God help me, the damned thing is of such a color. Good night.